Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On this week's program, a plan to slow the ever-growing theft of catalytic converters. And we begin introductions of some of the newly elected members of the Minnesota Senate. This week from the suburban districts of Lakeville and New Brighton. Stay tuned for this week's Capital Report. Welcome to this week's program, I'm Shannon Lurkey. If your car runs on gasoline, a special device called a catalytic converter helps minimize the release of harmful exhaust chemicals into the air. These catalytic converters are made with precious metals, which are a hot commodity and of great interest to thieves. I spoke with Senator John Marty about his bill to cut back on the thefts, and I began by asking him whether thefts are on the rise. They're very clearly on the rise. Um, it's partly, it's just a matter of the value of the metals, the catalytic converters, which the catalysts in them are precious metals that help break down the toxic pollutants. And so they require a piece of scrap metal might have $200 worth of scrap metal in it. And the value of those metals have gone up significantly in recent years. And therefore it's a very profitable crime for people. So yes, they have gone up. I think in St. Paul, they have gone up like um, fivefold in the last five or six years, and they continue to grow um, as people, as thieves find it's a quick way to get a couple hundred bucks. Uh, you introduced a bill that would make it more challenging for thieves to sell catalytic converters. You introduced the bill in the last regular session. You also introduced it in the most recent special session. What do you have in mind? Sure, there are several things we're trying to do. One of which is we're, it, it's all focused on the fact that the people who are stealing these can do it quickly and they can sell them quickly. And some of the scrap metal dealers are in effect fencing the fencing operations. They're marketing them to these thieves saying, here, you can get it quickly and easily, quick way to get cash. And unfortunately, all it takes is one of those sawzall types of electric saws. You just go slide under a car, a couple of quick cuts. It can take you less than a couple of minutes and it's well hidden because you're under the car. They do it on street corners, they do it anywhere in the middle of the night, sometimes in the middle of the day. And so what we're trying to do is block them from happening. What we are, several things in the bill, one of which is we require them to hold the converter for several days before they sell it. So if police or others can go there and check them out. Number two would be requiring them verifiable um, information on the fact that they're legitimately the owner of the catalytic converter. And the third thing we're trying to do is say scrap metal dealers can't buy them from anyone other than a bona fide business that deals with car repairs. Um, in other words, if I come in off the street corner and say, hey, I got 10 catalytic converters for sale here, and they pay me a couple thousand bucks for them, um, where did I get them? I mean, it's not like people just, oh, I just happen to have a collection of catalytic converters in my basement. No, they're, they're stolen and very obviously in most cases stolen. So we want to try and make it much more of a hassle. Who are the victims of these crimes? And does, you know, and how much does it cost for the repair? How much are these people out? And, and does car insurance help in any way? Yes. Well, first of all, car insurance does help because if you have a thousand dollar deductible and it costs you 2000 bucks to get it replaced, well, you know, boost your auto insurance rates probably, but it also will save you a thousand bucks on it because it's typical to be paying a couple thousand bucks to get a repair on a catalytic converter. We had one county commissioner from up in Stearns County um, spoke at our town meeting that we had on this, a community meeting to get people's ideas on this. He talked about a local nonprofit that had vans for driving people with disabilities. And he said they had a couple of them in their parking lot cut off and they were like $3,000 each to repair. And so it's hitting nonprofits, it's hitting small businesses and hitting family after family after family. I've talked to people who have one stolen, they get it replaced and they get another one stolen. Um, most of us fortunately haven't had this experience, but it's a couple thousand dollars out of pocket um, in most cases. And it appears that these criminal activities are on the rise. Yes, they're very clearly rising. As I said, in St. Paul, it's been growing significantly in the last five years. And that's not just St. Paul. I hear the same thing. We had this community meeting on catalytic converter thefts, trying to find out stories and things like that. 
We had a lot of callers from Minneapolis. We've heard from people in the suburbs everywhere. It's, it's a problem statewide. Uh, according to a Forbes article last year, California requires all businesses to document sales of catalytic converters with a photo or video of the seller. They also that requ they require that payment be made by check um, and to the business or the seller, um, and that there's a three-day delay before that check can be picked up if it's not mailed to a specific address. How do you view this approach? Yes, I think that's a good one. First of all, the getting the photograph, uh, requiring that scrap metal dealers, I believe, already have to do that. So yes, that's a good step. The other thing you just mentioned about California, where they can't pay them right away, they either have to wait three days or mail them a check or whatever else. Yeah, that's a good thing. And I think it's something we're looking at adding to the bill because you don't want to have someone who's just trying to get a couple hundred bucks of quick cash or a couple thousand bucks of quick cash to turn in a bunch of these, get the money and run. If they have to wait a few days to get the money, it's just one more barrier to their quick way of getting cash. And um, I think we ought to be exploring every kind of illustration like that. We had people who suggested, why not try and uh, require the VIN number, the vehicle identification number, that every car in the country has a VIN number on it. Why don't we require them to stamp that on the catalytic converter? That'd be great, but again, that takes that would take years for it to happen, and, and what about all the cars that have catalytic converters now? Um, there are all kinds of approaches to do this, but we think the simplest and most obvious is to make it harder for the thieves to sell them. And one other thing we have in the bill I didn't mention earlier, we would prohibit an individual like you from just going in and selling a catalytic converter unless it's, unless it's attached to a vehicle. In other words, the only people who could sell them to the scrap dealers are auto repair shops, muffler shops, things like that, that might have excuse to come across them. Somebody coming in just off the street saying, oh yeah, I just happen to have a bunch of them. Um, I think we start with the presumption that those folks may have stolen property there. Well, so I have two more questions. Um, regardless of the remedy to disincentivize the theft of catalytic converters, um, aren't this, isn't this whole industry suspect in and of itself? I did an internet search. I found a local business that advertised accurate and competitive pricing. Uh, the business also spoke of maximizing profits. So as a regular course of business, who, who really is selling catalytic converters? Uh, largely thieves. Um, any any auto auto um, dismantling operation, any scrap yard will have a lot of them too. Matter of fact, some of them you look for the price and how much you can get if they take your junker of a car. If they junk your car, how much will they pay you for it? And they ask you for the model number, um, the year, I mean, things like that. So they know how big the car is, what kind of metal they'll get from it and so on what valuable products they might get. And they do say, does it have all major components? And they list the three of them. They list transmission, they list engine, and they list catalytic converter. Catalytic converter is the one they list first because it's the most profitable part of the car. And so, yeah, those folks can have it. But if you, I mean, if I'm a scrap metal dealer and I'm getting it from an auto recycling center, um, it's obvious they may have 30 a day if they junk that many cars. but but you or I aren't going to have 10 catalytic converters unless we stole them. We, there's just no other reason people would do that. We put it in the bill as a total ban on an individual selling, but we'll take it out or modify it if we need to. We haven't heard anybody argue why that's a bad idea yet. Now, one more question. Is it, it already illegal to buy stolen property? Could charges be brought against scrap metal dealers, especially if they're buying significant quantities from probably people who stole them? Yes, I would love to see that happen. The trouble is it's hard to prove. Um, it's hard to prove they were stolen and so on. We're not set up for that. And law enforcement and prosecutors have so many other crimes they're dealing with. This is, this is purely an economic crime. I mean, it, it can lead to more dangerous things and it's a huge economic crime. But yes, we can prosecute now if we have the evidence. We're trying to make it easier to one, get the evidence and two, um, put the, the buyers out of business if they're going to, if they're crooked scrap metal yards, put them out of business. The honest ones can continue to thrive. The crooked ones, let's put them out of business. Senator John Marty, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you.
Jack Duckworth defeated DFL incumbent Matt Little by 10 percentage points in the recent contest to represent Senate District 58, which includes Lakeville, Farmington, and Southern Dakota County. I spoke with Senator-elect Duckworth this week, and I began by asking him why he thinks the voters chose him. Well, first off, thank you, and I appreciate your time. Uh, thanks very much for having me. Uh, you know, I think uh, very unique times uh, called for a unique set of perspective and experience, and I think that's ultimately why the voters chose to support me and send me to the Capitol. Um, as a member of the Minnesota Army National Guard, a first responder, a small business owner, a member of a uh, school board, uh, given all the unprecedented challenges that face us, I think folks realize this is somebody that's got some experience and perspective that uh, will be of value at the state capitol. And I'm very thankful for them, to them for that. You and Senator Little both made the effort to run clean campaigns, which is a fairly unique approach in our modern political climate. Why was it important to you to try to focus on issues and not demonizing the other side? Yeah, and I, have, I gave a, a lot of uh, mutual respect to Senator Little for that. And my philosophy was always this, it does no good for uh, the chair of the local school board to be speaking negatively about one of our local legislators and vice versa, especially during uh, a health crisis and a pandemic. Uh, we needed to be focused on the issues, our constituents, the voters and what we can do for them and, and how we're gonna help the state forward, uh, not continue to, to bicker uh, I shouldn't say continue, but not to bicker or negatively speak about uh, each other. There were plenty of uh, plenty of third party uh, entities that sought to do that for both of us anyway, uh, whether we liked it or not. Uh, but the fact that he and I were able to to kind of stay above that and engage each other respectfully uh, and stay focused on the issues, I think was very important. And that's something I always respect him for. So in, in answering my first question, you did run through your resume, which is striking. Um, you National Guard, uh, chair of the Lakeville School Board, uh, head of a real estate uh, team, a volunteer firefighter. You are going to be one of the younger members of the Senate. How does your variety of experience, what are you going to bring to the Senate? I think I'll bring a, uh, a perspective that is grounded in um, what young families are experiencing currently. Uh, I've got two little ones. Uh, my daughter's four and a half. My son is two and a half. Their names are Grace and Logan. Uh, and they're one of the reasons why I decided to run for school board when I did uh, just a few short years ago. Uh, but having that, that perspective of a younger generation, of younger families, and I like to think of, of a business owner, uh, will be something that the folks find valuable as we deal with such challenging issues right now as our, our, the education of our children uh, and um, some of the uh, restrictions that uh, our businesses are facing. So having that perspective, being a part of that group of, of people, of constituents, of that demographic, and helping that influence and shape the policy and the legislation uh, that we uh, craft moving forward, I think will be hopefully very beneficial. Your Republican colleagues certainly recognize your leadership potential, um, and it's demonstrated by the fact that they have put you on the Senate Republican Caucus leadership team. From, um, you know, freshman senators already have quite a lot to learn, and you're jumping in now with both feet. Like I said, you, you're very accomplished as um, at your age. I mean, which isn't, I mean, you're, you're younger than what we're generally used to seeing here at the Senate. Um, but is, is being this busy and this driven, I mean, is this just kind of how you operate? You know, I'll be honest with you. Um, I'm driven by passion to serve and that's what motivates me. And uh, I kind of jokingly tell people the, the busier I am, the higher I tend to perform. Um, and right now there is no, there are no shortage of ways in which we need good people, leaders to step forward and serve our state and our country and our communities. Uh, so that, that's why I've, I've chosen to step forward and, and do what I'm doing currently. Um, and I very much look forward to it. I'm extremely, extremely humbled by the fact that uh, my fellow, uh, my, my soon-to-be fellow peers in the Senate would consider me uh, to be a part of the leadership team. I can't tell you how um, uh, appreciative and thankful I am for that opportunity. And I, I, I'm mostly appreciative of it because I feel it will help me learn 
that much faster because as you mentioned, the, the learning curve is going to be extraordinarily steep, especially given everything that we're dealing with uh, at the state level currently. So I look forward to it. I'm up to the task, uh, but there's no shortage of obstacles that we're going to have to tackle head on. Now, you've mentioned this, and I, in my reading about you, I have learned that education is very important to you. You were elected to the Lakeville School Board in 2019, um, and you are now the chair. Your children, as you mentioned, are not even school age yet. What prompted you to run for school board, and specifically, how will that experience translate to the Capitol, do you think? Sure. So um, I'm a Originally, I graduated from Lakeville Schools, so I'm a product of the of the very school district that I'm, I have the pleasure of serving on the board on. Uh, and for me, it was about service to the community, making sure that we're continuing to provide fantastic education here in my in my hometown and in our schools. Uh, my daughter Grace actually has been enrolled in the district's uh, pre-K program, going on her second year. So we've we've experienced my wife and I both have experienced schools personally as students. And now we're experiencing it as parents as well. And so it was extremely important to us that we, we do what we can to positively contribute to, to that school district. Um, and I think as far as how it's going to shape my, my perspective moving forward, uh, this is probably the single greatest issue in which I feel that my perspective is uniquely situated to the task at hand. I mean, uh, just this morning I was dealing with uh, the issues that we're facing as a school board. And so to take that perspective, that firsthand knowledge, those relationships, and bring it to the legislature as we are debating how we're going to move forward as a state, how we're going to continue to try to provide fantastic education for our students while also trying to manage the incredible workload our educators are facing as a result of having to provide education in an unprecedented means. Um, it's something I intend to, to put to use immediately at the state capitol. Uh, community members, students, teachers, there are so many people right now that are, are uh, just pouring their, their opinions, their feedbacks, their perspectives into uh, us as local leaders right now in terms of what they're experiencing, what they desire, how it's impacting them and their families. And we need folks at the local level to listen, bring that feedback to the state capitol and advocate for the necessary changes um, you know, that are required to help us all get through this tremendously difficult time. Senator-elect Zach Duckworth, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. I greatly appreciate it. Thanks again for having me. Senate Chief Photographer A.J. Olmscheid set out to capture Minnesota's strong tradition of voting. Kunish Podine has represented House District 41B since 2017. Due to the retirement of Senator Carolyn Lane, Senator-elect Kunish Podine won her bid to represent all of District 41, which includes the communities of New Brighton, St. Anthony, Columbia Heights, Fridley, and a portion of Spring Lake Park. I spoke with her this week and I began by asking her what compelled her to run for the Senate. It's hard to pass up the opportunity for another adventure or another challenge for me. I, I especially thrive under those circumstances, but it also gives me the opportunity to continue working on some of the, the issues that propelled me to run in the first time uh, when I'm not at the, at the Capitol. I am a teacher. I'm a library media specialist in a middle school. And so for the last 25 years, I've seen the changes that have happened in our educational system. 
And that was, that was one of the things that I decided to run for. Um, I have been able to do some really good things in the House, pass some really good legislation. Uh, and I would like to be able to take those kind of things that I've done and uh, move them over to the Senate, hopefully sort of to educate the Senate as well, just as I've done in the legislature around issues um, and most specifically around issues that affect our American Indian communities, our tribes here in Minnesota. And so um, with those sort of uh, ideas in mind and uh, looking to create better relationships between the House and the Senate, I decided to run uh, to take this Senate seat and represent my entire district as well as have a voice in Minnesota. You mentioned Native American concerns, and I wanted to point out that Minnesota Supreme Court Justice Anne McCaig became the first Native American justice in 2016. Our Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan is the highest ranking Native woman elected to executive office. You are now the first woman uh, of Native, Native American descent to be elected to the Minnesota Senate. So how do you view these first, not only for the Native American commun communities uh, generally, but also because all three of you are women? Right, I mean, when you look at the um, indigenous culture, women always had a seat at the decision-making table. They have been political leaders and leaders in their communities for thousands and thousands of years. It wasn't an, until the colonialism came in and uh, the whole uh, patriarchal idea of politics came about. And so maybe for some of us, it's sort of a natural progression, but it certainly is uh, really a great phenomena for, for Minnesota when you think that this was the original Dakota land and the Anishinaabe lands, and you know, here it is 2020, and we have our first woman senator of native descent in, in our state, that's sort of a, a really sad realization. And so for me, it was, um, it, it's, it's, it's very, very exciting um, to be a part of that. And uh, when I was, so my, my mom is, was an enrolled Standing Rock member and her uh, great aunt, I heard the stories about her great aunt, Josephine Gates uh, Kelly, who was the first woman from Standing Rock to number one, graduate from Carlisle Indian School. That's one of the boarding schools. And then um, to go on and be elected to Standing Rock Tribal Council. It was, we heard about her leadership abilities um, and how she worked so hard, literally, hitchhiking back and forth to Washington, D.C. Um, to put together uh, good policy around uh, making sure that their, their tribes were taken care of. And so those were the sort of stories that I grew up with and uh, I'm just really proud to stand with these women, these Native women um, who were the first to do these things because we definitely know uh, that we need to have that kind of representation in in so many different ways across our state. You are a founding member of the People of Color and Indigenous Caucus, often referred to as the Posse Caucus here at the legislature. You also authored a bill that established the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Task Force, uh, of which you are the chair. Recommendations of that task force are due to the legislature in December, but I wonder, is the effort accomplishing what you hoped for? Yes, I'm gonna say yes. Uh, I, I uh, you know, I don't even know where to start. The moment it, I kind of had this aha moment that as a young, as a new legislator, it was within my capacity to create this task force uh, and not knowing exactly sure how to go about doing it or who would do it or what the outcomes might be in just uh, like two, three short years. Uh, I think we've done some incredible, incredible work around this whole pandemic of missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, boys, two spirits. Uh, and so we've been able to bring in so many of the commissions, our governmental commissions, so many of our community organizations that have been working and, and 
uh, addressing the violence against women and children and uh, sit down with each other and really talk about what the issues are and how we can ensure that, that we can disturb this, disrupt it. Of course, COVID interrupted this. We had uh, quite a few community conversations around the state uh, where, where we would invite uh, community members to come in and speak their mind, tell their stories, share their thoughts and ideas around it. And of course, we weren't able to do that once, once the pandemic uh, hit us here. But I can tell you that uh, the, the committee and um, Nigel Perot and Kate Weeks and Stephanie Autumn and the folks from Wilder have worked so hard and put together a really incredible report. And I, I can't wait to share it uh, with everybody in December. One final question before we go. You're an educator. Governor Walls is an educator. The future First Lady of the United States is an educator. What do you hope this means for education, especially as we begin to emerge from the scourge of COVID-19? Well, we are going to have to work so hard at rebuilding the health of our communities, literally and mentally, um, and as well as putting our schools back in order. I, I, I'm still teaching, uh, and so I, I won't be done till the end of this month. And I've seen firsthand how, uh, how this has affected the families. I've had parents on the phone. I'm the library media specialist, so I was in charge of getting out 900 uh, Chromebooks and supporting families and students and teachers. And I can't tell you how many conversations I had from parents and grandparents and students and teachers in tears and frustration. Uh, you know, how do we put our education back in order? And that means the federal government picking up the responsibility of not only funding the educational um, necessities that we're going to have down the road, and that means broadband and books and resources. Supporting teachers is going to be so important. This has been so difficult on teachers. We hear about so many of them leaving the, the profession. We are already shorthanded. How are we going to rebuild and, and restructure uh, our educational process so that it works for our students and our teachers and our families in a way that that's going to not put too much pressure on them because you can imagine that most students are going to lose a year to two years of education. So Senator you go Lex. back and start over. So we're going to need a lot of guidance from the federal government and that's what I'm going to look for um, because I know that that they value it as well. Senator-elect Kunish Podine, that will be a question we look forward to your work on in this coming session. I want to thank you for your time. Well, thank you for inviting me here today. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.